for the series of, of sermons I've, I've been preaching these last two months, I actually planned them back in June, uh, near the beginning of the summer. Now, this uh, final Sunday of August was what I saw as kind of an in-between spot between my Psalm 19 sermons and the series I want to begin soon on the book of James. So that'll be coming up soon. But I had chosen this psalm, Psalm 122, which is... Um, a psalm about how good it is for the people of God to be together and worshiping. I picked this psalm thinking that, you know, perhaps we might be at some liberal, limited capacity meeting together again. Um, and yet here we are, or here we aren't, I suppose, still not quite ready to be back together again yet. This past week, I, I wondered if I should change my text to something that would feel less ironic, I suppose. Uh, but the more I looked at it, I think the more I saw how important it is for us to have a time of longing to be together. And I think the psalm here captures, maybe puts to word, some of the things that we might be longing for right now. So I think it's, it's good for us to consider what a gift it is to be together. And how, right now, how can we be seeking joy unity and peace that God brings us in a time like this. So look on with me, if you will, to Psalm 122. Yeah, it's Psalm of Ascent. It begins, I was glad, they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and my companions' sake, I will say to you, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek your good. This is the word of the Lord. You know, when, when I have the opportunity, well, obviously don't quite as much right now, when I have the opportunity, I love to travel. Uh, I enjoy being able to see different places, meet different people and that I'm unable to see just simply from my own home. I love the creation of those new experiences and memories that you can pick up when you travel. But to me, I think one of the most satisfying elements, one of the most satisfying parts is actually going through customs on the return trip. Yeah, I'm not talking about the slow-moving line. I'm not talking about that ominous, overhanging threat of being pulled aside into some separate room and being interrogated. No, I'm not. That's not my favorite part. But what I'm referring to is that moment when you're returning to the country that your passport says. And the customs agent stamps the passport and says, welcome home. It's a real sigh of relief to hear those words, a real moment of comfort. You know, you're not at your home yet but your home and your country. Because for some of you, you might not be living right now in a place that's your home, but home is far away. Think of that feeling then when you do return home and you hear those words, welcome home. After years maybe, weeks, months, however long it's been that you've been away from home, feeling that restlessness, feeling almost homeless to a degree, in that moment, finally, you're home. And I think this feeling of homecoming is what the psalmist is, is describing here. Because this psalm stands in a grouping of psalms. It is the Psalms of Ascent. Now, the, the Psalms of Ascent here, Psalms 120 through 134, they were a way that the Israelites would prepare their hearts for journey and assembly for worship at the temple in Jerusalem. So there would be certain times throughout the year where they would go up to the temple in Jerusalem and they would, on this long journey, sing these psalms. 
And this psalm is about what it means to have Jerusalem to be your home because Jerusalem, well, what's there? It's the house of the Lord. The temple is there. And worshiping in the house of the Lord meant presence with God. By going there, they had presence. Now, we don't need to go to this physical building here to have the presence of God. We are grateful for that. We have the Holy Spirit with us. But I think still we might be able to connect with that longing. Because even though, yes, we have the Holy Spirit present with us, and we have the presence of our God, we don't have full unity together now this morning. And I think the psalmist here helps us understand what it means to long to be in the midst of God's people. He understands that in our home, in, in coming together to worship God, we are to enter into this time, enter in with, with joy. And as we do this, we are to dwell in unity. And lastly, we are to pray for peace. Those three things are very clear in this psalm, entering with joy, dwelling in unity, and praying for peace. So first, looking at entering with joy. Because right here, in the first verse, we are met with how happy the psalmist is to go up to the house of the Lord. And, you know, maybe if you've read this psalm in another time, too, you may have wondered, you know, and don't worry, it's not an impious question, but you may have wondered, you know, what is so great about the house of the Lord? Maybe you haven't always felt that way about going into church. If you think back when you were a kid and how it felt like you had to be dragged to get ready for church and it was not something you looked forward to. I think we need the, uh, to understand why the psalmist had that excitement, why he had that gladness, and how can we share in that joy? Because, you know, if you look at the Psalms right before this, right before Psalm 122, you have Psalm 120 and 121. And 120 says these words of a exhausted, a weary traveler who's hanging on to the Lord for aid. He says in 120 verse 1, In my distress... I called to the Lord, and he answered me. And then, in the next chapter, Psalm 121, you see the voice of a traveler praising the Lord who is his keeper, who is his shade from the harsh sun. You start to see the story, if you start in, in 120, of this traveler seeking God and moving through the wilderness to get finally now where we are in Psalm 122. He has arrived he is in Jerusalem. He has reached the gates, and his companions say, let's go up to the house of the Lord. He's endured this long period of waiting. He has experienced trials on the way there. He has experienced the harshness of the sun, the darkness of the night. He's felt isolation. He's felt danger. And now at last he's going to ascend up to the house of the Lord. It's over. He's home. He can have joy in coming home now. But think about this. When, when his companions say to him, let us go up to the house of the Lord, in that next verse, where does it say they are? Their feet have been standing in the gates. They are right within the boundaries of Jerusalem. They are close. They can just about see home. They can look up to the Temple Mount and see the Temple. They're not fully there yet. They can't fully rest from their journey quite yet. It reminds me of a a time uh, many years ago where it was Christmas season. Emma and I were engaged. I was going to go fly out to see her. But along the drive to the Milwaukee airport, the snow had just started to fall. I stood there at the gate where I was going to board my plane to see my fiancé, and I watched the snow continue to fall down and collect on the wings of my plane, and watched my departure time start to get pushed further and further back until my flight was canceled altogether. 
So then after shuffling down to the ticket counter, I booked a flight for 7 o'clock the next morning. But I went outside and I looked and the snow was still falling, falling pretty heavily. And it became very clear to me that I wasn't even going to be able to leave the airport for the night. So instead, I crawled up on the floor of Mitchell International Airport, laid there all night under the bright lights of the airport, using my backpack as a pillow, and being continually, every hour, awoken by the present reminder of the voice on the intercom saying, the local time is 2 o'clock a.m., and I'm still awake. It's one of the most restless nights of my life as I waited to get on the, fu- the plane to see Emma. And yet I was right there, wasn't I? I was right there at the gate of the airport, still not able to get in. Perhaps you can imagine that kind of restlessness right now. Because our sense of community, your sense of togetherness, is so broken apart right now. How can you enter in with joy this morning? I mean, you can just about start to see each other, but only over video. You can even at times be in person, but through a mask. That feeling of almost being united, but not yet. Many of us haven't even moved anywhere, but we still come to church from our bedrooms, our living rooms, watching on a computer. Your feet are standing in the gates, aren't they? You're close, but not yet. It might be hard to have joy for worship right now. It might be hard to really figure out what joy looked like a year ago, even. In normal times when you came in to worship. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard to find joy, to fully accept that joy in our worship right now. And what I'm referring to is the fact that no matter what, even in a time of isolation or a time where we're coming into worship every week, we're still struggling with joy at times. We struggle with with joy because ultimately, we are always far from home. And what does that mean? I... Our full home, our final resting place, our true home, is not here at Harvest. And I think that's important for us to remember what home is, because our final home is with God. And what we do every Sunday, whether it's here in person, whether it is in your room, still in your pajamas right now, every Sunday morning of worship is a dress rehearsal for when we worship with the whole church of God throughout all history, all time, all space, coming together to worship God together in the new heavens and the new earth. That's what we're doing in worship. We are preparing for that future, future home that we have. That's where the joy comes from. It's not simply because of the great things that we get to do and the friends we get to see. Because that's not final. As we've seen in this last year, that changes. So if we stick our joy in things of this earth, we're going to lose our joy quick. But we pin our joy onto what's coming next. Often we can lack joy because we get restless for other things of this earth. Pinning our things on hopes of successful careers, of a happy family, of a stable relationship, of success in school. All of those things are good, but they don't lead us to following Christ himself. Because it's our Savior who's leading us home. It's our Savior who's leading us towards joy. Those are the things that bring us home, not the things of this earth. But that's how we can see this time on Sunday mornings. That's how we can see worship. Because as you log on to worship this morning, think for a moment. Consider that you are stepping towards the gates of your heavenly home. 
you are turning your thoughts to your Savior who's prepared a place for you in his Father's house. That's the direction, the trajectory of our entire lives. And that's what we consider when we come here in person or in line. When we get to the Sunday morning, we can reflect with joy that Jesus is bringing us home to be with him. And what we do as we respond to our Savior with joy, we're to consider something that we've talked about in other sermons as well, but what it means to dwell in unity. Joy flows out of this idea of unity. Because the psalmist shifts to looking at what makes Jerusalem herself, what makes Jerusalem great. And he identifies that it's, it's tightly knit together. He says in verse 3, Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. I bolded those things, bound firmly together. The, the tribes are separate pieces of Israel that are bound together here. Because this event is not just for the psalmist and his companions. No, it's for all the tribes of Israel. All of Israel coming together to worship the Lord. Even though the nation of Israel has several, has 12 different tribes, they're a diverse people. It's this pilgrimage to Jerusalem that they act as one and worship in unity. That's God's purpose for Israel here. For the whole nation to be like Jerusalem is described that they're bound firmly together. He describes the city itself as as knit together. Not just in a social sense, though, but it's held together in a profound and a deeply meaningful way. The tribes of Israel do not go up to celebrate all the things that are different about them only. They go together because they are compact. They are firmly bound for a single purpose, to praise the name of the Lord. Worshiping together the name of the Lord is something that is part of the national identity of Israel in this time. That's what makes them different from the nations because they worship Yahweh. And that practice is something that every single Israelite can say, yes, I stand with you on that. Because in a very real sense, Jerusalem as the place of the temple is home to all of Israel. It is the home of to the throne of the king of Israel where they look to justice. And it is the resting place of the house of the Lord. And yet I think, if you know your Old Testament, the irony of this passage is because Israel was not always unified. During the times of the judges before the kings, there were wars between the tribes, the tribes killing one another. After the reign of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was split from the northern kingdom and a southern kingdom where Jerusalem stayed. The people in the northern kingdom no longer at that time would journey to Jerusalem. They would not experience what the psalmist speaks of here. The Judeans in the south certainly did not fellowship with those in the north. That kind of division to the people of God is something to lament. And Today, I think we can look around and say the world doesn't look that much different from that division that we're talking about. Because if you look around, you, you will quickly, quickly find ways that you might feel divided from your neighbor. In this year, we alone see that there are so many ways that you can find division. And we have a presidential election coming up in a couple months. We see divisive responses to the horrific killing of African-American citizens. We have these voices being raised here outside of this church this week and division as to how we need to correct abuse of power. We've seen divisions in the world over the response to COVID-19. 
And maybe you have friends, you've got family, you've got co-workers who feel so strongly about one side of these issues, about what we should or shouldn't be doing. You can just be on the internet for a few seconds and find there are battle lines drawn all over many events of these last few months. And these divisions around us can even trickle into our church. They can trickle into home. And we must be wary that even though we're united in what we believe about Jesus, that division can still come in. But when we see our church as our home, when we see that Christ has brought us into the family of God and we dwell in union because of what Christ has done, we see a body, a a unity that doesn't grow old, doesn't grow apart, it doesn't change because of current political events. It is stable. It is tightly knit. It is our union with Christ that brings us unity. We today are union worshiping our Savior who has brought us to God and calls us blameless because of his death for our sin. If you yourself are not only united to Christ, but you are also united to one another. So let's think about what it means to dwell with each other in that unity as well. Because of that, we need to seek that unity. We need to look at ways that we can practice unity. So we should live a life that reflects the facts of what Christ has done. That means that we must... We have to seek to resolve disputes. We must seek to reconcile with each other in the church. It means being willing to step forward and bring what grievances we have with one another and desire for unity. And unity is a tricky thing because it doesn't mean that you have to feel fuzzy feelings for everybody. You can still be hurt by someone and still seek reconciliation and still have those scars, those pains, but what reconciliation, what unity means is declaring that what Christ has done for me, he's done for you. And I acknowledge that unity, that, that togetherness that we have because of it. And we can pray that those feelings of, of, of love trickles down from that. But sometimes it's an important step just to step out and say, I need to express my unity because of what Christ has done for both of us. Even that step can be hard at times. Because it means letting go of some of the things that really bother us, holding on to really negative feelings we might have. So there are sometimes on smaller issues we might have to say, you know what? This is not worth harming the unity of the church. It means expressing forgiveness towards one another, even when it's hard to do. It means being patient with one another. It means helping those right in front of us that are afflicted. Because that is saying to them that you are not in a lower position, but I am with you, united to you because of what Christ has done for both of us. And to say, I will care for you. Unity affects how we feel about each other, yes. But sometimes it's as simple as just how we act towards one another. It is a, it is a process that we go through of how that affects our feelings, but it is an important first step. Because our charge as Christians is to care for one another. Our charge is to forgive one another. That's such a critical such a crucial part of dwelling in unity. But we do it because of Christ's forgiveness of us, of you. And we do this because our church body is our home. And there can be disagreements within the home, but it's important to stay and keep each other in the home. And ultimately, it's important to have peace within the home. So lastly, we see the psalmist praying for peace. He is exhorting us. He is asking us, telling us, pray for peace. He says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. 
For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, Peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Now, the psalmist says several times in here about peace. And that idea is idea of wholeness, of, of completeness for the people. It is security that he is praying for. He's praying that Jerusalem would experience a soundness, a welfare, a health for all people. And this is more than just absence of warfare. When we think of peace, we think of no war. But it's more than that. It's about things being in a place of balance, of a wholeness. And so, he doesn't only pray for Jerusalem itself, but as he marches, he marches through the city, praying for the peace of all the different facets. He prays for the security of those who love Jerusalem. The idea here of security is more than just the idea of safety but ease of prosperity, of quiet. He wishes that they would experience the wholeness of shalom and also that their lives would have prosperity and blessing. He prays that they might find peace within the walls and security in the towers. And he's mentioning, what, towers, walls, these objects of fortitude, of, of protection, where one might be able to rest, know that there's no danger there because they're safe, that they can be at rest. These establishments stand for, for monuments to peace because they're immovable. They're, they're immense. They stand, these towers, with a quiet, peaceful strength. Not only for the sake of those who love Jerusalem, but he also prays for the sake of his companions, his brothers, those who are close to his heart. These people who have felt along with him, who have been on this journey, they have experienced the same hardships that he has. They know, they know what it's like to live without peace, without security. So he prays for their peace. And ultimately for the sake of the house of the Lord, the temple, he resolves to do the good of Jerusalem, for in Jerusalem has peace, and the temple is honored and upheld. What, is, uh, what does that look like for us this week, even? Because it's this idea of peace that holds the former ideas that we mentioned together. It's the times in peace that we find most easily to rejoice, times in peace that we can find unity. So the psalm says that we should pray for peace. Pray for peace. I think it's hard to speak of it this week. I think it's hard to speak of peace when our summer has been bookended by death of black men and women at the hands of officers whose duty is to protect the peace. It's hard to pray for peace when the desperate cries of no justice, no peace ring throughout our city. When those cries ring outside your bedroom window, it can feel like no peace is going to come to our nation. That's why it's so important that we pray for peace right now. Because we need to pray for the peace now more than ever. You know that now how desperately we need it. So my, my heart has been grieving for my black brothers and sisters in Christ because throughout this summer I have seen them and say that they are emotionally drained. And my fellow Christians are weary. They are without peace. And maybe you feel the same way this week. Drained feeling after seeing another video of a man shot in a city in flames. So you are here this morning feeling like you don't have joy. Because you don't have unity. You don't have peace. But we pray for peace. Why? We, we pray the pe for peace because we serve the Prince of Peace. We pray for justice because even though it's clearly missing in our world, we believe that Jesus has brought us peace. That justice was done on him, 
and so that we have peace. Because he brought it by his death. His death as an innocent man, this brought peace between you and God. Jesus died for your sins. He died for the sins of even the violent and the hateful people. Jesus died for the sins of the selfish. He died for the sins of those who divide against one another. Those sins drive us away from our God, but Jesus died to bring us to him, to bring us unity, to bring us peace. And we can respond with joy in that as those things bring us home to him. That's our prince. That is the king that we serve. So let's pray that message of his peace be brought into our hurting state, into our hurting nation. Let's let that prayer be constant in your mind. As you pray for thing, peace, think of the facts that you're at peace with God because of what Christ has done. Let that peace be reflected in how you relate to your fellow Christians. If anyone has hurt you or wronged you, if anyone has treated you unfairly, consider how you can treat them with the grace of Christ and offer them forgiveness. I want want you to think through this of how you can consider to be a messenger of peace right now. So we've been thinking and talking a lot this summer about racism. It it itself is a marker that people are not at peace with one another. So when you encounter a statement or a post that is harmful or, or racist or hurtful towards other people, ask in that moment, not not how can I prove this person wrong, not ask how can I just make this person better with an argument. Ask yourself, how can I use this moment to bring the peace of Christ into this conversation? Your job isn't to fix everyone's broken mind. Your job is not to make everyone better and like you. What you can do is respond in a way that points them to the promise that Jesus brings. Point them to consider how their own faults and need of a savior. Because as we consider how to pray for peace in our nation, we have before us a great a gospel opportunity, don't we? Because between our fellow men, it's possible when we are brought to God in Christ, all of us have peace with God the same way, an equal way that we're brought to Christ. So how can we pray for and speak of peace towards others? Because for our fellow Christians who are weary and exhausted, how can we bring them the hope and peace of Christ? For those in need of the message of Jesus, bring that to them. Show them the peace of our home. May peace be a mark of our worship and service of our Savior. Because it's by his peace that we're called home. As I think about the house of the Lord that the Psalms talks about, it was not always a place of joy, unity, and peace. If you read Lamentations, the book that describes the destruction of the temple at the hands of the Babylonians, you see how that place of joy, unity, and peace fell into destruction and bloodshed and war. But know this, that peace did come to Jerusalem. But it didn't come from within the towers. It didn't come within the walls. Peace came to Jerusalem outside the walls. Our peace came from a crucified king on a hill overlooking Jerusalem. Because Jesus Christ died and rose again for your sins, conquering your dread, the division around us, conquering your brokenness. It's through him that we have joy in worship. It's his death and resurrection that we are unified to him, unified to another. And it's in him that we have beautiful peace. So let's, let's make a home here. In whatever fashion that we have to meet together, we are being brought home through those things. Because Christ right now is seated in heaven. He is preparing a place for us. He is preparing your home. And so in our worship, as we conclude today, consider that. Until that day, we're making a temporary home. 
as this unified body of believers until that final day when we can finally say that we are home. Take a moment now and pray in your heart towards that.